So the free energy principle um, originally emerged from systems neuroscience as a way, a principled way, of understanding what the brain does and how it does it. Subsequently, the principles proved to be so simple and so powerful that they've been applied in a variety of contexts now. So one could almost regard the free energy principle as a, an organising principle for any living system that shows the, the characteristics of life. So the reason I start like that is that there are two roads to explaining or understanding the free energy principle. We can either start from the perspective of people like Helmholtz in the 19th century trying to understand unconscious inference in the brain and build a story through uh, analysis by synthesis and psychology through to current um, and exciting developments in machine learning, things like Geoffrey Hinton's Helmholtz machine, and then how that has become contextualized in the inactivist or the embodied cognition context um, and generalizing these notions and you end up with the free energy principle. Or you can start from the top and just ask very simple questions about what it is to be alive. And if you are alive and you exist, what sorts of behaviours must you show? And in fact, if you answer those questions, you end up with exactly the same answers that you would have got had you followed the historical route. For brevity, I'll take the high road. I'll go from uh, the, the, um, the minimalist assumptions that um, things exist and just try and unpack that and show how one can get to notions of the brain as an imprint engine, sometimes called the Bayesian brain hypothesis, uh, the brain as uh, one of the best examples of an organ that is actively constructing explanations for its own sampling of the world. So uh, this, active, this inactive perspective is very important because not only does the brain then have to explain all the sensory input, it also has to choose which sensory input to sample. It is in charge of gathering information, evidence, for its own predictions and own beliefs about the world. But I've jumped ahead, so now I have to explain to you why is it that any system that exists will behave as if it has a model of the world and it's trying to gather evidence for its own model of the world. So the story starts just by acknowledging that if you want to talk about something, there has to be a separation between the thing you're talking about and everything else. And in fact, if there were no boundaries, there would be nothing, because there would be no distinction between a thing and not that thing. So statistically speaking, that distinction or that boundary is called a Markov blanket. Um, it's just a mathematical way of separating states of some abstract world, system, organism, culture, life, cell, brain, um, into things that are internal to the boundary, that are owned by that system, and things that are outside the boundary that are external to the system. So it could be a cell and its milieu. It could be a phenotype, it could be me and my environment. It could be, well, at any scale, there has to be this division. Now, the very existence of that separation, that Markov blanket, in conjunction with the assumption that that system exists over time tells you something quite profound about the behavior of the internal states and the states that constitute the Markov blanket. This is a bit abstract, but it's actually quite simple. The Markov blanket has two bits to it. There's the sensory states that are just defined because they don't influence the external states, but they do influence the internal states, so it's sensory information, for example, would be mediated by sensory states as I get from the outside world into my internal world, my brain. And there are active states that go in the other direction. So they, are in, they influence external states but are not influenced by the external states. They are actually dependent upon the internal states. So um, if I take me as a model of my world, my active states would be how I am currently moving whereas my sensory states would be the activity of my photoreceptors, all the sensory organs and sensory epithelia I had at my disposal. Let's put that Markov blanket aside for one moment 
and just think what it means for a system to exist over periods of time. What that means is that it is effectively resisting a dispersion by random fluctuations. So perhaps the simplest example here would be if I dropped um, uh, or placed a drop of ink in a cup of water, then almost immediately it would start to disperse as random fluctuations dispersed all the molecules around. Um, and I would not call that drop of ink a living drop of ink because it has dispersed. If, however, I placed the drop of ink in some water and then, to your amazement, you saw it gather itself up, then relax a bit, and then gather itself up again, like it was breathing, as if time was reversed. You would say, there's something very peculiar about that drop of ink. It's almost as if it was living, and you become quickly convinced it was alive. And the only reason you were endow it with the property of self-organized life, biotic self-organization, is that it's not dispersing. And the only reason it's not dispersing is that all of its internal states and its Markov blanket that separates it from the rest of the water are moving towards the centre of the drop. They, so that the flow of the molecules of the system is exactly countering the dispersive forces that are trying to disperse it throughout the water. Now that flow, operationally or mathematically, can provably be shown to be simply um, moving uphill on the probability distribution of where the ink molecules should be. And that probability distribution, mathematically, is also the same as something called Bayesian model evidence. I can't, I don't have time to go into it, but it's just a beautiful observation that the, the defining dynamics of any system that does not dissipate over time is that they, on average, will move or their states will flow so as to maximize model evidence, Bayesian model evidence. So that means that if a system exists, then it will appear to maximize Bayesian model evidence. It will appear to be a little Bayesian engine. It will appear as if it has a model of its world. Why? Well, because that system, let's now go back to the Markov blanket, that comprises the active and sensory states and the, uh, and the internal states that are encompassed by the Markov blanket. The law, the rule, which says that all of the states must, must maximize model evidence, which is um, also known as marginal likelihood, that is also um, in inverse upper bounded by free energy, hence the free energy principle. All of those states have to maximize marginal likelihood or minimize free energy including action. That means action and sensations and the internal states are all doing the same thing, which means that we can understand the internal states of the brain as modeling the world because they are maximizing the Bayesian model evidence for me or a model of the world. At the same time, my action is also trying to maximize the evidence for my model of the world. So put very simply, almost by definition, I am in the game of garnering information that maximizes the evidence for my, my own existence. And that's basically the free energy principle. It's a corollary or a consequence of any system that doesn't dissipate. It looks as if it has to behave as if it is maximizing, actively soliciting information from the environment and modeling that information as a model of the environment, to maximize the evidence for its own existence. And that's where we started with the long history of the um, Helmholtz's notion of unconscious inference right through to modern day machine learning formulations. Uh, for example, uh, the, the Helmholtz machine of uh, Jeffrey Hinton and Peter Dyer. That can be unpacked at many, many different levels and it has provided a very useful framework within which to understand how that free energy principle is complied with by the biology and the anatomy and the physiology of the brain. What it tells you is that the anatomy of any system has to contain with it a model of the environment in which that system is immersed. Which means that if we live in a world 
that has some deep hierarchical structure in which there is action at a distance, for example, you know, so that um, the colour of objects around me is determined by the incident light as it comes almost instantaneously to my eye or a falling body is caused by gravity, then my brain must recapitulate that causal structure. And of course it does. The very fact we have nerve cells with long slender connections connecting each other at a distance speaks exactly to the fact that the causal architectures of the world that we inhabit have this action at a distance and this sparse connectivity. Furthermore, the hierarchical structure of the world is recapitulated in the neuronal structures that constitute the hierarchies of the connectome or the uh, hierarchical disposition of uh, functionally specialised brain areas. If the brain is truly a statistical model of the world it inhabits, can we understand some fundaments of brain organisation such as um, the distinction between what and where streams in the brain? So a very powerful observation, a principle of uh, functional specialisation is that where processing for a stream of brain areas roughly down here and a more dorsal stream is concerned with what? That may be a simple reflection of the fact that we live in a universe where different things can be in different positions. So that we can statistically separate the whatness from the whereness. If we lived in a universe where whenever something moved it also changed its nature, we couldn't do that. So just by looking at the brain, I can tell you the sort of universe that you inhabit under the free energy principle, under the assumption that your brain has become a model of the environment that it inhabits. The free energy principle has been quite useful from uh, my perspective and that of my colleagues, um, largely because it um, shows the connections between previous theories. Um, so there are many um, global brain theories that have been brought to bear, for example, um, the principle of minimum redundancy and maximum efficiency, notions of the brain extracting as much information as it can from the environment. There are other um, theories um, that speak to how we select and value certain behaviours. It's useful to see how all of these become special cases of a variational principle, which um, in this instance is the, is the uh, free energy principle. Which means that you can, you can now talk to different disciplines um, and see how one particular construct, theoretical and all the empirical evidence, speaks to another theoretical construct and uh, essentially see how they're approaching the same problem from different perspectives. Because you've got a principle framework, it also allows you to um, make very particular hypotheses about the process theories that would be that would conform to the principle. So I've, all I've said so far is that, uh, in principle, every internal state, every action I make, every sensation that I gather, should be in the service of minimising variational free energy or maximising marginal likelihood. How? How do you do that? How does a brain do that? But if you know what the objective function is, if you know what the process, the, the, the imperatives are, you can then cast it uh, in terms of a process theory. So for example, I can say, well, this minimization of variational free energy or maximization of uh, basic model evidence is a hill climbing or gradient descent algorithm. So I can now write down a differential equation where everything, every neuronal um, state, physiological variable in the brain now becomes describable as a differential equation given other states in the brain. And if that equation is true, then I can now go and map the variables to physiological processes. And if one plays that game, you can, get an in, you, you can go an enormous way in starting to understand not just the anatomy, but also the physiology. And also you can generate questions, because there are alternative process theories that all conform with the same principle. So does the brain use uh, sampling uh, techniques to maximise model evidence, or does it use um, hill climbing optimization schemes, variational schemes? So that you start to generate a whole um, testable raft of hypotheses pertaining to the process theory, they're all consistent with the overarching principle. <laughs>